I'm going to talk about how I edit movie support to Avery Slamden. And the title of this presentation is called Jets, a Rebuilding Service List Framework by Avery Slamden. All right, so um, now I'm going to do my intro, I guess. My background, uh, the traditional background slide, is my name is Tom. I run a consultancy company called Bullhops. It's working specifically on AWS and only AWS right now. Um, over the last couple of years, I've been very lucky to have a recent couple of open source tools. So you see a bunch of logos up there. Uh, they're all actually AWS specific tools, and they are all actually um, focused in different areas of AWS. Uh, for my work in the Docker ECS space, I was recently recognized as AWS Container Bureau. Uh, so, that's, so that was cool. Uh, and tonight, though, we're going to talk about the one that I found in the cloud with the two Jets Blackberry called Jets, the Ruby Service Framework. Okay, so I wanted to start my presentation off with this. I thought this was hilarious. This is a website called serverless-ruby.org. It's a petition. Basically, there's a bunch of people, and this guy started his petition in March 2018. They can pray this time with that and support it. And that happened. <laughs> so, uh, rumors are there's a lot of rumors that EOS is actually working on its support, and it's just a matter of time. So, hopefully, when they add it, that'd be fantastic. That'd be great. Um, but I just thought that this site was pretty hilarious. So, you can actually run Ruby on EOS Lambda right now, or any language for that matter. And a lot of people have actually documented um, how to run Ruby on EOS Lambda. So, this road that I'm going to talk about tonight is a little travel road. A lot of people have actually done this. Uh, that first link up there is on the EOS Compute blog itself. That's Amazon's official blog. They've documented that they have in other languages, such as PHP and Premium Go. That article was written in 2016, December, before Build support was officially added. Build does now run on EOS Lambda. Um, other guys, this one dude who wrote Building Ruby Rock, a boss on the EOS Lambda. Um, another guy wrote Romda, and I guess he takes Travel Ruby. A lot of people use Travel Ruby to bundle up Ruby, and they kind of add support to EOS Lambda that way. Um, and another person wrote How to Run Ruby Scripts on EOS Lambda with Ansible. So, a lot of people have done this before. And the way they do it and they cheat it is something called a shim. Typically, a no shim. So, what's a shim? So, this is the trick. Um, you write uh, data assignment functions in a language that's already needed to be supported. Then you call out to another language. And then you take the results of, in this, in this case, Ruby. Then you take the results of Ruby and you shove it back up to some native sort of language back to data assignment. So, that's actually how it's done with a shim. Um, it's kind of like a moving session. So I just found this random full screen image uh, online. Uh, it's kind of like a dream within a dream. So in this case, the language within language. And uh, the issue with uh, kind of accepting a dream in dream is once you kind of, let's see if this kind of clicks. Once you get into one dream, right, the first dream is slower. <laughs> so it's kind of like the problem with shame are two sales, right? It's slow. There's some overhead associated with take one language, call it to another language, and shove it back to another language, right? Um, and the reason it's slow is because of something in EWS Lambda called the AWS Cold Starts. So this is a really well-known issue with AWS Cold Start. So that's supposed to be an image of a car cover snow and the engine next to it show like a cold engine to help me explain this. So and uh, AWS Lambda Cold Starts, what are they? So um, when you call an AWS Lambda function, essentially what happens is a container stand up your code gets executed and those results, then it's back that out to AWS Lambda. Well, there's some overhead in the very first time calling a camera because it never existed before. All right? So that overhead is known as the cold start. And the really interesting thing about AWS Lambda cold start is it varies depending on how you configure the function. So, for example, let's say with the end, um, AWS Lambda function, you can trigger anywhere from 120 megabytes of RAM to 3 gigabytes of RAM. Well, AWS Lambda allocates a proportional amount of CPU according to the RAM you allocate. So if you are you're being like kind of cheap, which is fine, it's good to save money, but if you're you know only allocating 120 megabytes of RAM, you're gonna get slow CPU, like slow. So when you're allocating a little amounts of RAM, the cold start is even more significant. You can update a couple seconds before your Lambda function runs and executes. Uh, let's say you're using a language like Java. Love Java, great language. <laughs> But the JVM is uh, kind of large, <laughs> right? Loading that up out of this into memory takes some time. It just that's you know that's just how it can work. 
So uh, Cold Star's are a uh, problem in uh, Java, in the AWS Lambda world. Let's say you're using a custom VPC. So you want your Lambda function to have access to your only your custom network. Um, well, what happens during the bootstrap strapping process of AWS Lambda is it's less an easy to instance, it creates an EMI or version network card, then it attaches that version network card to the instance, then it does some magic to connect that EMI to the container, then it runs a function, and then it sits back up. So that's like a multi-step process. There's some overhead associated with that. Upwards of over 10 seconds with VPC. So this is something you should be aware of when you're using AWS Lambda. But you know, AWS Lambda developers know about this problem. It's a well-known problem. So what do they do? That is not an engine on fire. That's a warm engine on the engine. That's supposed to be, that's what it's supposed to represent. Um, guess what I could do? No, I did a little bit better in this next slide. So this is the pattern that a lot of people use when they uh, op operate serverless in AWS Lambda often. What they do is they set up the cloud launch event room on a schedule basis. It periodically pings a Lambda function that then ends out and calls other Lambda functions within your, within your application with a dummy pre-warm pre -warm payload. The only point of this basically Lambda function call is to warm up your Lambda function. Um, and so this is, this is what you do. This is how you kind of keep your Lambdas uh, warm and then you don't have to deal with the full start problem. Now, let's see what happened there. Oops, I think, uh, I was okay. So the reason the Lambda pre-warming works is because it's something called the Lambda execution context. So I explain what pre-warming was. So Lambda execution context, what is the Lambda execution context? Well, it's basically essentially the environment that Lambda function runs in is a free view. So anything you put outside the handler code of your code block, that only gets run once, and that's Lambda execution context. The reason that what matters is because once you understand that the Lambda execution context is reused, right, you don't have to pay that penalty. By using the Lambda execution context, you avoid the full start problem. That's actually text from the documentation itself. Talking about the full start problem, talking about the Lambda execution. That's the best documentation right there. And so, the reason I gave all this context, why are we warning Lambda function important? What the Lambda execution context is, is to understand how you add native support, not just Ruby of, of, of any language, that is Lambda right now, today, at native speed. So what Jets does is it takes the Ruby server, it shoves in Lambda execution memory and keeps it in there. Right? So subsequent requests are extremely fast, basically native speed. And here is a quick performance benchmark. So on above there, you have Ruby function being curled out to. Uh, that's returning 164 milliseconds. The bottom one is Python, 178 milliseconds. They're essentially the same, right? It doesn't really matter. This bottom end is not going to be the Lambda function, it's going to be the network speed. Right? Okay, so quick demo. Very quick. So let me switch over. I think I'm actually going to log in, so this is going to be fun. Oh, sweet, I'm in already. Um, I just want to test. All right, so, so this this is gonna be fun. I'm gonna try to tap one edit. See how this works. Okay. So this is a core request of a, a Jet application already deployed that's hitting a Ruby function. You can see it's returning about 200 milliseconds. And here is another curl endpoint that I'm gonna hit right now. That happens to have Python, that's the close start of it. Okay, Python's not actually being pre-born. But you can see that essentially it's the same speed. So I just want to show you that live real time. Okay, so back to this slide deck. So we did the first demo. So before moving on, I wanted to go why again. Why, why, why? What's the point of you doing this, right? If you're going to be working on AWS Lambda, you're going to eventually be working with something called cloud formation. Cloud formation is infrastructure as code. It's the way to basically write your Lambda functions up in YML, right? But this kind of reminds me of uh, the 1990s when, uh, when Java was moving a lot of their kind of um, logic from Java code, which is fine, to XML. <laughs> and it was always like debugging XML, you just have to change that slight little thing, then it will start working, right? 
because you're moving, you're not actually writing code, you're writing YML or you're writing XML, right? So that function up there, it doesn't actually look that bad. It's like 50 lines of code, it's pretty understandable. But you might have an application with 20 Lambda functions, okay? And then you need it to test the memory size. You got copy and paste one time, right? So uh, on the other side there, you just basically have Ruby, which is being used as glue code to generate basically that exact same yarn. But now you have access to the power of programming language, which is going to make the code way more maintainable, way more real. Okay, so this is a typical web architecture that's serverless. There are no servers here. Um, this can be built with Jets um, and or other frameworks, great for that matter. What we have is you have a user request coming in, it's hitting API gateway, that's a RESTful API. Those uh, endpoints then call Lambda functions and they can return. So we're going to actually do a demo of building this entire thing during this uh, presentation. But I'm going to actually show you, I think, yeah, I'm going to show you some code first. <laughs> so we talked about like, he was landing out through Morgan, the Lambda execution context, hopefully that was helpful. Um, but actually, I'm going to show you a code here, like Ava's landing code. So Ava's landing code, usually all you do is define a method, end of it, and then you get a take an event in context, and no plan looks the same, and also Python looks the same. This is written over your form. This is what it would look like if Ava's landing was supporting it, right? But the funny thing is, there's actually not a lot of value with this besides adding Ruby support. There's not a lot that's doing there, all right? So Jeff's code actually looks more like this. Right? This is inspired from REST. That's a controller code inherited from the application controller. Right? And if you're creating a post controller, there's two actions there. There's index action, there's show action. So there are two Ruby methods there. You have access to a render helper. That render helper renders async, render HTML through action. You also have access to parameters. You have access to the raw Lambda event itself, the raw table. All right? Um, but even though that was like, there's probably a Rails program here. Even though that looks like Rails code, that is not. That actually generates Lambda functions for each public method out there. So what Jets does is basically it evaluates the code and it generates Lambda functions that correspond to those methods that are public methods. So those are the kind of corresponding Lambda functions over there. They're the corresponding uh, um, Ruby code. Jets also supports routes. Once again, it looks like Rails routes, right? You draw the routes and you say, connect this URL to this Lambda function or this controller action, right? And what that actually does is it generates API gateway resources. So those lines of code right there will generate all those API gateway resources for you. Jets also has a notion called jobs. So this is nothing more than map jobs, pretty popular pattern. You don't really want block out of requests. Uh, any request that takes longer than a uh, second, users are going to leave. <laughs> So you, you, got, you got to keep that web request fast. So the common pattern is throw any slow code into a background job or a queue. Uh, so that's what supports that also. Uh, so you have kind of the rate kind of expression up there. So there's going to run that basically method every single 10 hours. And there you get from. That's going to run that method every single 12 hours. But once again, that creates AWS resources. That's creating an auto watch event pool. So uh, AWS has something called auto watch events, and there's actually something uh, called a schedule event. So you don't have access to a scheduler. You don't have to run a set of schedulers here. You don't have to run a set of workers here, because that's running service. The schedule here is also service. OK, so this is what a typical test project structure kind of looks like. You have the app controllers, the helpers, the jobs, the models, the views, the typical MVC. The JavaScript loader is using Webpack as the real spot is currently using right now. To so a package of JavaScript and uh, CSS. There's a big folder, there's a big folder for database YML and other application wide settings. DB folder for migrations, both final DB as well as uh, basic active record, Postgres supporting. The public folder for certain public assets, and the spec folder for tests. Okay, down number two. You guys get two. Is this yeah, I think I'm fine. Uh, and you guys can hear me too, right? So I don't have to pick up the mic. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, CD, let me just let me make sure I'm on master because I was messing around with this uh, in the hotel. So Jet's new demo. Okay. So uh, for this, what I'm gonna do? Okay, actually, I can actually talk over here. Okay. So the first command is Jet's new demo. Right. 
So what that does is that creates a, uh, basically a cell map with all of the folders that you kind of need. App, controllers, views, config, folder, all that, right? And then immediately it does a, a, a bundle, a bundle of stuff. So it solves the application dependency. Then it solves web hacker. Oh, I guess the command finished. So then it solves web hacker. So that's what doing web hacker is a lot of help. So I'm just going to skip right through it. And then, then it does get initialized and then it does your first command. All right, just from one command. And then it gives you a kind of browser message saying, okay, this is what you need to do next. Okay, so we're going to do what it tells us, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to see you into demo now. I'm actually typing Google in hand because I use copy and paste here. That makes it easy. Then we run scaffold. That's kind of familiar, isn't it? So that uh, created a post uh, model with a, a title column with a migration to. I don't migrate because I've actually migrated the database locally already. Now I'm going to start up a local server. So I'm going to bind this local server to so 0000 because this is actually a server running on EC2 under another service called Cloud9. Which is a you know, this is the browser, right? I'm using a browser right now as my editor. It's, a, it's a basically a remote editor. Okay, so let's actually go check this out and see what happened. I want to figure out my phone numbers here. Okay, so if I were to set this up, hmm, a lot of demo. So I'm going to take this. That, so I'm sorry, sir, locally, and uh, by default, it runs for ADE, and that's a slash local page, so that's a dead app on the running right. And, and remember, I created a sample of post, right? So let's check out post. Oops, I appeared with this slash. Okay, so here's post. Loading, eventually. Okay, uh, there you go. So you guys some records ready. I already have the database. Let's create one more record just to show you so you can put, like, the basic thread is working around the back with that uh, sample command. So post five, submit. And okay, go back. You can see. So the browser's going to work locally. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take the application and we're going to pull the database lambda. Okay, control C, fill the server here. So then we run the next command. So the first thing I'm doing is that I'm actually I'm copying environments of variables, which sets up the database underscore URL. It's actually has a point of the little database, right? And this is going to be running the lambda. And so my database credentials are in there. And then I'm going to run the just the plug command explain what it's like kind of doing, I guess. Yeah, I'm going to copy this. This is a, this is, you can think about it as locally, basically, but basically I'm using Cloud9, which is a, a, a ID that's browser based. Um, yes. But it's essentially locally, right? So uh, the reason why I'm actually using Cloud9 is, this, and I'll explain this, is, um, so what Jess Deploy does is first it bundles all your assets locally in a temporary area because it needs to figure out what gen needs to zip up into the code file that it uploads S3 for Amazon to run. So it can bundle all of the dependencies locally. And on top of that, uh, then also sets up a vendor copy of Ruby. <laughs> right? Amazon does this for Ruby. So what it's doing here is it's literally shutting Ruby, the interpreter, into that native lambda. Uh, you can see it's actually pretty big. <laughs> 76 megs, right? The limit is 256, or 250, I believe. So we're still a little bit far from the limit, so that's good. And then it also does uh, some evaluation of the gems to see whether or not the gems have compiled extensions. And they do then be replaced with some pretty compiled gems that are working on, on the, within the APIS line environment. Okay? And then it finally does a confirmation stack update, which basically handles the deployment. Uh, so you kind of see the point. Uh, you can also see right here, it's time to upload code. This is why I have switched over Cloud9. It takes a while for my slowing right at home uh, to upload 76 minutes. That uploads in one second because of, thanks to Ava's generous EC2 family. Right? So, um, uh, so what's happening right now is it's actually uh, been going to app by confirmation. So why don't we go down and take a look at confirmation to see actually what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Um, there we go, update in progress. So it's still kind of creating resources, but you can see the confirmation stack that Jets basically deployed. So uh, Jets basically deploys um, a lot of these ABOS resources by confirmation. You can see there's more than one confirmation template there. There's a couple of confirmation templates that are nested. This is to get around the 200 resource limit of confirmation. So uh, basically, nested stacks you can get around limits and you can have as many resources you need. All right, so what does actually, um, 
confirmation crates, but I'm gonna start taking a look. Let's look at the demo now. Uh, app, controllers, posts, all right? So we're gonna actually look at the code now, all right? Uh, let's also bring up browse up in that fancy now. Let's kind of move it down here. Um, out of that, out of that, and let's not forget. Okay, I did that pretty good with one hand. Okay, anyway, so let's look at Lambda. Um, it's still deploying, but it should, uh, let's see where the deployment is right now real quick. So yeah, the deployment's actually completed now, uh, and then it spits out the API uh, endpoint, so you know where the application is, so you can actually grab it and go test it. So why don't we actually really do that real quickly right now? Let's grab this endpoint. Okay, and there's the Jets app running. It says this time on Avis Lambda remotely. Okay, so let's go to scaffolding. Post. Okay, uh, there's a scaffold, and let me click around and kind of create some uh, some records, I guess. Post six submit. Notice as I kind of click around here, how fast this is happening. This is basically essentially an ABC because it's keeping that big server in memory in that Lambda execution context that I explained earlier. Okay, so there it is. It's the front app that I'm running there. Okay, um, let's see. Let's actually look at the resources so we can understand what's going on here. Okay, so there are the lab functions on your left, and there are the, I'm sorry, there are the, that's like the uh, devs code on your left. And I'm going to still this because the whole devs app's running, you know? Demo, uh, and here are the uh, lambda functions. There's corresponding lambda functions here, right? There's separate lambda functions right there. And why don't we just go in and actually run lambda functions on the console, right? So, so we can understand what's going on here. So it needs to test tables. If this action doesn't actually um, use the parameters past it, so you need to run anything there, you can test. You can see, it returned about 15 milliseconds there, and it returned a JSON table. This JSON table is called a lambda proxy structure. This is kind of the structure that you have to be able to from a Lambda function, or it's parse out and then serve a single page. They expect the status field, the headers, and the body. Okay? So that's the uh, Lambda functions. Um, let's see what else we should check out. API gateway. And the raw style down there, right? So that one resource is a uh, line. It sends off the setting product uh, resources. Right? Create, read, update, uh, delete. And then here it is. Here's demo dev. Yeah, those are very corresponding yeah, to what the reason is right there. Okay. So, let's see, I think I'm going to go back to slide deck. Okay, so, uh, two demos, that's done. And I just want to review what we just created, right? We created a completely serverless architecture on Avis Lambda with a couple of lines of code and a couple of commands. Right? We created all the API gateway that's what it was there. We created all the Lambda functions to connect to the RDS tables that I did create. Right? We did not create down there a, a, a schedule jobs just for the same time. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, so I want to jet support resource model. I'm not really talk about this. So the token of this a hard job, it's a background job, it has a great um, method that tells it it runs Lambda function every single 10 hours. Right? I just want to emphasize that that one line of code, it spans out to a resource method and calls that resource method. And that resource method then associates a PowerWatch event rule with a Lambda function right there. Okay? So the reason why I'm pointing out is because this is a core model within JEX. Every single kind of convenience method, like RAID or ROM, leads to the resource method. All the apps in JEX leads to a resource. By understanding this, you can actually create any custom resource you want on EOS. And then you can create your own app on top of this and more convenient, the more pretty, the more retainable. Okay? Okay, so we cover the API RESTful kind of architecture, but I've actually been building a uh, with Jess, uh, different architectures out there too. So this is event-driven security with auto remediation. So in this kind of diagram, what you have is a cloud washing vegetable pattern over there. And it's basically modern cloud trail for any time somebody authorizes to open up support from you know, a security group setting, reveals the security group, well, creates a security group, or at least deletes a security group. And then what happens is, is watching that, 
and it will then fire off a lambda function, and that lambda function will be like, why do you open the port 22 to the world? Close it back down and send me an SMS alert. Right? This is important for some uh, companies with security concerns. Um, and then what that lambda function does is, regardless of the security port, regardless of the um, associated with ACP instance, all those hidden group or RDS instance down there, it will lock it back down within a minute. Right? Uh, with at AWS, things change so dynamically that you have to automate everything in order to make everything secure. That's how you get, that's the successful way approach it. So what does that code look like? It looks like this. Security job. Did the pattern, right? Right there, right above the method. Then the method down there with the business logic, custom to whatever you guys need. Then you guys get flow back down on that security port you need to. What does that get translated to? This. Well, I'm not looking, right? So it's kind of insane. What we're doing right now, currently in service, is we're writing YML and we're maintaining YML, right? And that's fine, right? It just, you know, it's a lot of lines of code. Yeah. And notice also that it doesn't just create a vendor rule. When you write the YML, you also create a permission. You actually have to give permission for the Lambda function to be able to execute from cloud launch vendor rules. Um, but that's kind of handed for you with that, um, with that syntax over there. Okay, so event uh, driven security also supports uh, multiple event patterns. So let's say if you want to just you want to just look at multiple event patterns, you just simply declare more event patterns on top of that method. It appends it to array internally, and then it creates more AWS resources. All right, so I wanted to before I cover the next architecture pattern, um, polymorphic support. So yes, it's a Ruby serverless framework. But you don't have to write Ruby. <laughs> why, 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 why? Why do anybody want to do this, right? Well, it turns out um, there's not a lot of Ruby AWS Lambda functions out there online. <laughs> so uh, if you want to reuse code, uh, it's actually very beneficial to be able to write in another language, right? So Jets are looking at this the glue between multiple languages and kind of glue all together. So this is kind of calling more support right now. I found this actually very useful. You'll see some examples soon. But this is a, a Jets Lambda function uh, running Python 3.6. This is also a Jets Lambda function running Node 8.10. And this is what I actually call the more free support looks like with Python. You see, the post controller has a Python keyword that references a single call index. And then you create a post loader, a Python loader, like this one right there, and then you put in the index.py with the right Python. Then you literally paste your Python code in there, and then move on to life, right? Node looks very similar. Node, this you call node keyword, you call show, you create a node folder, and you create your node folder there, so you can state the language of your choice. Uh, notice though, with both node and Python, the handler, you have to return that full Lambda proxy structure, the status code, the headers of Python. There's no extra help you're getting from Jets. With Jets, you don't have to do that, right? Or with Ruby code, that's kind of baked in. Because this is simple handler code. This is how those examples online for our reason. Okay, so another architecture pattern now that we've been introduced to polymer support is um, continuous compliant with AWS config rules. So uh, AWS config rules is a service from AWS um, that basically constantly monitors your AWS account and ensures it's uh, compliant according to your own business logic. So with AWS config rules, what you can do is you can pass a report, like a spreadsheet with a bunch of checkboxes, like green checkboxes, saying, look, I approve you to the security auditor that this account is compliant. Right? I have proof of that too. And if somebody makes it uncompliant, I'll know within a minute. Right? Continuous compliance. Uh, AWS config supports both managed config rules as well as custom config rules by Lambda functions. Right? So they, they just released a bunch of new managed config rules, which is really sweet. So then we don't kind of write if one of what we have to. But if you have to, then you write your own Lambda functions too. And what does a AWS config rule look like? Let's hopefully you're starting to see a similar pattern. Right? You can hear it from, uh, in that case, I guess, just rule based, but usually it's application rule. Then uh, at the very top, actually, I use a define property just saying every single uh, function in this class is going to be writing on this Python 2.7, not Ruby. Right? And then I give it a config rule description as scope, because config rules are scope to different resources. Config rule will monitor different AWS resources, and you tell it what resources to monitor with the scope and, uh, property. And then there are missing a little pop-up, I like 
polymorphic support from using Python to call out that um, pure Python method here that I did not write. <laughs> right? I just grabbed it. It's through in there and I moved on my way. And then this is kind of the dashboard, uh, kind of the view of the fully compliant kind of account here that, uh, that has been set up. Uh, not fully compliant, but this is a bunch of rules that's been set up. So this is what it actually goes to take the dashboard looks like. Compliant, compliant, show this your auger, kind of move along the way, right? And again, it's not going to happen with the cycle every single three or six months. It can happen every single minute. It just changes too fast. We have to do it the same so. Okay, I put together this just for this presentation because equally is office. They do the IoT things. <laughs> They're really gonna hack this together two hours ago. Okay. Invent driven internet things. Okay. So IoT. You can like hook up anything nowadays to the internet, apparently. Because I had a lot of fun finding all the side and throwing them to the slide. Alright? And then so these IoT devices, they can basically uh, connect up to IoT topics, research they create my assignment. Then uh, you create the IoT rule which filters kind of which um, things you want to get action on. Then you do an IoT action and you call, guess what, the custom serverless lambda function again. In this case, it's just an example, it's talking about MDB. Can I literally really pack this together right before this? So what will it look like? One line of code, right? One line of code, the lambda comes right underneath it. That happens to be it could be Python, it could be Node. Doesn't really matter. That's the temperature drop, I guess, and it's going to report the temperature. And then you're going to set up the image to What does the code look like? And why not? This is what people are doing nowadays. <laughs> right? This is what people do. Alright, you can create lambda function with this Java right here. Then you can create your IoT topic right here, reference the lambda function, and don't forget, you have the permission or else it's not going to work. Right? There's the kind of permission. And then you also have to make sure the principle is IoT coming from the right service, because IoT is a service that's probably here. Okay, so I wanted to kind of really briefly cover dead features. So if we talk about pre-warming for like the first 10 minutes of this presentation, so pre-warming is baked in. Upon deployment, it, it calls pre-warming and pre-warm all your functions uh, with that band out technique there. It also uh, gets run on a regular schedule basis. Um, you can configure it to higher schedules or lower schedules or faster rates or slower slow rates, basically on the one configuration problem under configuration application already. Uh, Local server, we actually use them now, right? It's very useful to be able to test their lambda functions locally. <laughs> Amazing, like a lot of people don't have this, right? Um, Jets call is another feature. So, Jets call, what that is, is a CLI command that also allows you to test both locally and remotely the lambda function. You just have to have that local to test it locally. You have to, you can basically test your code before you deploy it, right? Uh, there's a rebel council too. This is IRB basically loading the Jets uh, environment as well as your application code. Another uh, useful thing to test locally. Uh, database support supports RDS Postgres currently and DynamoDB. Lambda function properties. So lambda function properties, uh, when you define a lambda function or you update or edit a lambda function, you can define like memory, timeout, um, custom VPC, good find environments, variables, all these things are lambda properties. Just allows you to uh, define function properties at the function level, so very specific to so every individual function. You have separate function properties at the class level and also application wide. Right? So, a lot of control over function properties. Uh, very important are IMA policies. IMA policies basically control uh, permissions and allows your Lambda functions access to AWS resources. So this is pretty crucial. IMA policies also give you control at the function level, at the class level, and in application model. And lastly, uh, polymorphic support, which I kind of covered earlier. You can call it other languages if you need to. Uh, here are some working examples. I had a bunch more, but I just didn't get it in time for this presentation. So I'll initially post them, and so there's a bunch more examples. Uh, and uh, for the guys who are taking pictures, uh, there's a link to the slide down here, so you guys have it. Um, and Q and A at the end here. Yes, question back. Uh, I still, uh, you know, the runtime part is still Node.js, right? But how did you stick the Ruby in uh, the Ruby temporary stuff version of Node.js? No, no, no. The, so the, the question was um, the runtime uh, is Ruby, so how did I get Ruby packaged into uh, Lambda? 
So when we ran Jets deployed, that's when it, it, it downloaded a Ruby from kind of the S3 bucket back on our set of 3 CDN. And that's a pre compiled version of Ruby running on the factory uh, compilers on an EC2 instance that was uh, running a, uh, Lambda AMI. So I used the official Lambda AMI, pre compiled Ruby map, then now we have the binary, right? As long as that Ruby is a compiled right architecture, it's going to run. Right? And this is really interesting because a lot of them will just have this problem too. Let's say you're using Node, which is officially supported, but you're installing Node and you're installing NPM package. But that NPM package requires a binary extension. If you compile it in your local machine and you patch it up to the other side, you're supposed to have more work. So, are so you running it from the resources outside? The no, no, it's all done to let them run within the other side. So, you're running it right on the host. Yes, yes, but then he does on it. It's like it's kind of developed with the code as value, essentially. Yes, question. Um, you're talking about the computer functions of the right? Um, but who would be paying for idle then? Sure. So that's a great question. So you said, you, I talk about keeping the functions more, but don't get the pay for that. Yes, you do. But if you don't do that, you're going to have the close start problem. So everybody does it. You have to do it, and usually, let the functions. AWS is not very specific about uh, how long they keep the functions up for before they start recycling them, but people have basically done a lot of statistics around this. It's usually a couple hours, like 48, usually. So um, I think by default, I have it working every single 30 seconds, uh, but yeah, you can adjust that. Um, it just depends. AWS is not going to be specific about that right now, please. More questions? Okay. Yes? So, so the question was, do I have data on comparing to performance data comparing what two different platforms? The word machine? Virtual machine. Virtual machine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, the second scenario, if you buy it into a container, you get the same specific of the virtual machine. Oh, I see. And also compared to the server instances. Once the container is warm up, there should be no substantial performance difference, right? But the cold start there will be, because the container hasn't been started before. But once it's warmed up, no, the, the performance speed, uh, the bottleneck speed the network speed, right? The, it's always going to be the network speed at that point. Um, it's, it's not going to be the container is hard around. It's hard around. It's not like, and this is actually why, let's say you're just running your typical VM and a typical Lester by Apache. You know, there are configurations of Apache that basically start with Apache and load your code into Apache memory before it starts from traffic. That's why they do that. Apache does kind of close our problem because what you can do is you start Apache first, you form your application, and then you start serving the load balance traffic too. So, how do you have the secrets and these are the Apache? Sure, so secrets are right now handled through environment variables. I'm going to add a little bit better secret support using uh, Amazon's AWS Secrets Manager for the Google service. And that, uh, that's a nice uh, so the question is how I handle secrets manager. Right now, just handle the requirements of variables, which will show up now, so unfortunately. But you can basically specify that some environment variables are secret, and then lock it down with a kit, what's called a kit, and that's something that just needs to be added. Should be pretty simple. Yes? One thing is that's clear to me is there are you still using Lambda so what's the original languages in security there? Sure. So the question was, can I still use Machine? Yes, I do have to use Machine because we really support it and officially support it. And the original language that Machine written is Node.js. Node.js is the original. So every request you would do is being a process from the Yes, but that shit happens outside the handle of code in the land execution context. So that shit happens once. Does that make sense? That's how you make tasks. Uh, that's the, I think, that's the, 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 the
the Moody process is, uh, is running, like is waiting for uh, uh, time. You don't, you don't have to have time for it. Okay, I'm going to go back to the, um, an example right here. Right? Let's see. I just need to find one little example that has it. Okay, so, right, this little example is fine. So, the Lambda function that's going to be running this code inside here uh, is running not within the execute context. The context is outside of it. So, the shit looks really outside here. That gets only run once. So, if you like, let's say you run this Lambda function and you go like close to the little world, then you run it on the console not one time, but two times. You only see both the little world one time. Because it's going to reuse this section and it's never going to run that code outside here at the same time. This is where the AWS Lambda documentation uh, encourages you to establish database connections and make network calls, anything that's extensive, because it only gets happened once and gets reused. And that's the trick, basically. You just have to see how the AWS Lambda kind of works. Any additional questions for good? Don't be the database request this qualification. The last time you've done it. Yeah, sure. Have you ever had a problem with uh, concurrency? So if you're if you have a request for all bunch of stuff in parallel, now you're gonna have another one start because one of them had to be more of these the use already. Yeah, and, uh, so the, the question was how I ever had a problem with concurrency if a lot of requests come in and then you're gonna close our issues. Yes, of course. Uh, so that's when you have to adjust the group percent higher. Right, so you can't wander that. So even though it's serverless, right, you still have to kind of deal with the full start problem with any language. And I would want to do something around kind of auto kind of reporting. That would be kind of neat. Then you don't want to need to deal with that, right? You can kind of use kind of the historical information to figure out when and how often. That would be really fun. And I'm happy to take a little request too. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, I'm going to be around here for any kind of questions one on one you guys want. I'm just basically hanging out until tomorrow. Okay, cheers, guys. Thanks. Thanks for coming. <laughs>